Hello, you are watching a replay of Facebook Live, and today we've got Jimmy Ho from Pukeko Rental Managers, and I'm excited to ask him some some interesting questions, and we will have some live viewers who will have a chance to ask their own personal questions. So, hello, Jimmy, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Maxime, and thank you very much for inviting me to your show. Can you? Hear me fine? Yes, I can. Perfect mm -hmm. sound. It's strange. For some reason, I cannot hear you. All right. Is this a bit better? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. That works fine. All right, Jimmy, tell us Great. about your company. How did you start in the property rental business? Oh, so, oh, so, 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 uh, with um, with so I've been investing in South Auckland probably for four years now. Right. And at the time when I started the company, I did I couldn't find a good property manager within the South Auckland area. I did have a manager before. She was actually very good. She went on holiday, and there wasn't anyone to replace her during her holiday. So from then on, I started managing my own properties. And South Auckland is a really good place to invest. The, um, the tenants are actually not as bad as people make it out to be. In the four years of investing in South Auckland, the, um, the properties I have in Manurewa, which is considered quite a bad part, they haven't had any rental arrears, and all the tenants in them have been very good. No cases of substantial damage or anything. So, yes. yeah, I've been very happy and very fortunate to um, get into South Auckland when I did. Awesome. And... As of about one and a half years ago, I decided to start my own property management company, doing this commercially for other landlords. And I'm also pleased to say that in this one and a half years, we haven't had any rental arrears as well. So it's been a, um, it's been a great journey. Great. So how long have you been investing in the Auckland market? In the Auckland market itself, probably close to 10 years. I started out with a, a CBD apartment. And then I've also bought a lot of units, added a few bedrooms to them as well. Before I started going for a higher cash flow and aimed at um, yeah, heading out to West Auckland and finally South Auckland. Mm -hmm. okay. with, um, with the cash flow side, it is right now in the market, there's probably not a huge difference, but the biggest point of difference with South as opposed to West or Central or East is that for the price of a unit or townhouse or apartment, you can get something down here with um, 800, 900 square metres of land for a similar price and a similar yield. And that gives you a really good opportunity in the next few years with the unitary plan to come mm -hmm. through and start making some serious equity and cash flow. Sure. So what do you think about the current market? Is it going up, flat? Is it growing? What's the rental market at the moment? The, um, on the rental side, being winter, it's, um, it's always a little bit quiet. Uh, renting, tends to do renting doesn't seem to follow the same trends as selling. Mm -hmm. So it is mainly just a yearly seasonal trend that we find. The best times to rent out a property in a year are um, probably from early February through to late April. Mm -hmm. And then again from September through to early November. You'd really want to have all your rentals filled up by early November. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you could well be facing quite a big drop-off over the Christmas period. Sure. Um, finally, the, um, it differs as well for each region. We do find that South Auckland, the likes of Manurewa, right now is actually pretty quiet. Whereas Papatoe, the slightly better suburbs and the more convenient suburbs, you get less of a drop-off over winter and close to the Christmas period as well. I see. So do you manage the whole Auckland or do you specialize in, say, South Auckland or any other particular area? Oh, we tend to specialize within South Auckland, but we do look after other landlords who have other properties in Auckland as well. So the furthest north we've gone is uh, Coatesville up in past Albany, it's where all these lifestyle blocks and mansions are. The further south we've gone is Ramarama and Waiuku. And we also look after these lifestyle blocks as well. And they come with a different set of challenges as compared to the um, two-bedroom units in Papatoe. So what sort of challenges would you mean? 
Uh, so the further you go out of Auckland, so mm -hmm. for instance, a unit, a house in Papatoe versus a house in Papakura or Drury. So the house in Papakura, sorry, the house in Drury or Papakura, you would probably find that out of 10 applicants, seven of them would have dogs. Mm -hmm. Whereas close to the city, you'd find that you'd only get one or two applicants with dogs. Everyone else doesn't have pets. So pets are a big consideration as well the further you go out from the city. Okay. Uh, closer to town as well, car parking is probably not as much of an issue as further out. Mm -hmm. So the likes of um, Sandringham or Onehunga, because you've got good public transport systems there, when you do buy a house, the, um, the car park isn't as valued as, say, a garage for a property in Papakura because everybody loves their cars the further south you go. You just have to. Um, there's no other transport choices. And finally, with lifestyle blocks, you get a very good demographic coming to apply for these. You do get people wanting horses, livestock, rabbits, sheep. And all of these have their own issues with um, soil acidification. You've got to put lime into the soil. You've got to look after your septic tanks, and you also have to look after the, um, the water pumps and the soil land around the place as well so different properties have different challenges so what are the common mistakes that you see people make especially landlords uh, with private landlords it's um, the most important area to get right in property management is the tenancy selection and we have seen a few private landlords that well we we go to help them we have seen a few private landlords run into a bit of trouble when it comes to tenancy selection. Yep. So it is a uh, matter of just being thorough with the credit checks and the reference checks. People can appear very nice, and but once you dig into their job records or their job history, things start to things start looking a bit fishy. Mm. And unfortunately, even we have actually met people who we walk away from and they seem very nice and we're going great. They do seem like great tenants. Once the credit checks come in and once we call the landlord references, it's a completely different story. All so right. the model of the story is to check the references, check the credit checks and also do a bit on the uh, Facebook and social media background checks as well. Mm. 100%. So what do you do if you've got uh, a difficult tenant? How, how, like, what are, the, what are the solutions? Uh, with the tenants that we find ourselves, no one has really been that difficult. I mean, we do have tenants who were at high paying jobs, but then they've had a health scare or a heart attack and that's unavoidable. Mm. We have taken over tenancies from other landlords and yeah, they have been difficult. So the, the key thing to do is to work cooperatively with them while protecting your own position and planning for the worst. So most of the difficult tenants we've had so far, they still want to live at the place and they still want to pay the rent and they don't want to get evicted. Mm -hmm. In this situation, we have followed up with a uh, paperwork. So it'd be the 14 day notice followed up with a with a uh, mediation hearing asking for a consequential clause. And mm -hmm. a consequential clause is a really fantastic thing within the RTA that lets you give a payment plan significant teeth. Mm -hmm. A consequential clause means if you miss a single payment, well, to the tenant, if you miss a single payment, you have to leave within two working days. So that's very, very tight. And it protects your position as well while giving the tenant their time to sort things out. Mm -hmm. How easy it is, uh, Jimmy, to add a clause? Say you've signed a contract with the tenant or mm -hmm. you signed a contract with the landlord. How easy it is to change the contract terms, like if you want to add additional conditions? You'd usually, there's, um, there's two pathways to do that. So the first pathway is just to go 90 day notice and then sign them up for the new contract at the end of the 90 day notice. The second pathway is to mutually agree to put these in. And so this happens quite a lot. Sometimes you get a change of flatmate and then you draft up a new mutual agreement to replace one name with another and you also sort out the bond. Mm -hmm. We have used a mutual agreement before for, um, 
for things like lawn mowing costs. The yeah. um, yeah, so with with lawn mowing costs, we have had tenancy agreements where they were included, and the rent hasn't gone up for five years. So in that case, we've gone back to the tenant and said, from now on, I want to agree with you that you guys mow the lawns, in lieu of a um, yeah, and and from then on, they would be responsible for that cost because they do know as well that this is a um, yeah, this is a this is a mutual thing between both the landlord and the tenant and tenants do know that they are being under rented and they've had had it good for quite a while. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, Alex is asking, should you accept if your tenant wants to pay cash? Uh, generally, as a landlord, I mean, do you want to be driving around to their house and collecting the cash every week? That's a good point. My first question. From a, um, from a practicality point of view is not great. We have met tenants who want to do a cash transfer in a bank, and in that case we do ask for a bank check. But yeah, from a pract it's mainly a practical perspective. It's um, There's nothing wrong with paying cash, it's just do you want to go down that, that track and end up chasing, chasing them and beating them in person? It's quite inconvenient. But say if he wants to pay for half a year front or full year, uh, paying up and ahead is a, a different story. So you do get tenants who offer that. Mm -hmm. And what the Residential Tenancies Act says is that with the, as a landlord, I can ask the tenant for up to two weeks in advance. Mm -hmm. I can't ask for any more than that. With a, um, if the tenant then offers, then you can take it, but it has to be held in trust in your trust account. And if the tenant requests it back, because they've paid ahead and more than what the RTA says that they're legally required to do, yes. say they pay you six months, but then they leave the tenancy, then you have to repay the tenants as well. So that's it's generally something we don't encourage. Um, but if the tenant does offer, offer, say, three months in advance or so, then we would accept it, but we can't ask for that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, what if the tenant leaves the property without notice? So the, t the first thing to do in that case is probably physically go around there and make sure that they have actually abandoned the property. Mm -hmm. um, if they have, then you would head to the tribunal and you'd gather your evidence first. There is a procedure in the tribunal that gives you an accelerated pathway to terminate the tenancy for abandonments. So you can go down that track. Mm -hmm. And secondly, if they haven't given you your three weeks notice and you do lose out on the rent or you do lose out on other, um, or you do lose out on that, then you can claw that back through the tribunal. Mm -hmm. um, from a property manager's perspective, abandonments aren't necessarily the worst thing mm -hmm. because they have left the property, left the property vacant for you to relet and retenant. There are worse things that can happen if they, stay there and squat then that's a much that's actually much more serious mm -hmm. so how long does it how can how long could it take for you to fix the issue like if it takes a month is it going to be empty and you're going to lose income uh no the expedited procedures are a lot faster okay and um yeah this is this does come down to a choice with the uh, with the landlord whether they want to skip that and start advertising right away. Now, technically, that is a breach of the uh, Tenancies Act, but this is a uh, conversation that you that we would need to have with the landlord. And so far, we haven't actually had any abandonments. People have asked us to release them from fixed terms, but yes. when that happens, it's usually by mutual consent rather than one party disappearing. Mm -hmm. I see. Anything else that's um, like if you would start yourself today, say you bought a property and uh, you would want to rent it out, anything yeah. you would do differently compared to what you've done in the past? Like, what's your uh, what's what's your life experience was in the past? Like, mm. uh, we haven't had any really really bad tenants. 
there have been some picky tenants. Um, yeah, but having said that, I don't mind picky tenants because they will point out everything wrong with the property. Mm-hmm. But then that gives you the chance as well to repair things like water pairs, water pipes that break, or any um, any build up of issues. And they're actually we quite like picky tenants. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of going back and like looking back to my previous experiences before I managed myself, yeah, some areas of Auckland do attract bad tenants quite a lot more than good tenants. And places like Otara, Otara mm-hmm. is probably worse than Clendon Park. Mm-hmm. And so looking at, looking just taking a general investment perspective rather than a property management perspective as well, mm-hmm. it's probably better to buy in a slightly better area. So rather than purchasing Manu Rewa or Otara or Clendon, try aim for the level above that. So the, um, the Papatoes, the uh, Totara Heights and Hill Parks. And with these areas, you get a good combination of both equity and cash flow. So the, um, and the biggest, from a development perspective, your profits in building, say, in Clennan Park or building in Manurewa, mm-hmm. they are much, much less than building in Papatoe. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, it's, not a, it's not just a 10 or 20% thing, it's actually double or triple going to a better suburb if you do go down that development track. If you can afford it, of course. Yeah, if you can afford it. Um, <laughs> I've got some people saying they don't have sound, so I hope I've pasted that they should be sound, Richard. Yep, I can. Are they going through the mobile? Yeah, it could be. Um, could be the mobile network. Um, Jimmy, with recent changes, um, do you think it is possible to manage the property yourself? Like, if you want to save money. Um, I mean, it's, it's nearly, it could be 10% of the annual rental income, right? So it's quite a lot of money. Why, why don't you manage it yourself? Say if you, do, if you would be a landlord, a property investor who's, who wants to start uh, investing this year, mm-hmm. why don't I manage it or should I manage it myself? Like, how can I decide? Um, when we talk with our clients, it's mainly, they do, they are, um, there are some clients who can manage themselves and we actually say them say to them, if you're doing a good job, you probably can continue looking after yourself. What happens with a lot of our other clients though is that they'd rather spend the time on more productive activities. So they might own a business or they might own or they might have a lot of children that they'd want to spend time with. So with a lot of our clients it ends up becoming time rather than a money issue. Mm. But with um with so with the new changes in the um in in the RTA and with the installation requirements, having a manager with the tools and the software to do these things can is actually more value than ever. So in other words, a landlord doing it privately is actually doing a lot more work now than they have done even two or three years ago. So now they have to do things like installation checks, um, alarm checks, uh, regular inspections are now down to every three months as well. Yep. That's not an RTA thing, but that's an insurance company requirement. And so with all of these checks, a lot of landlords are coming to us and saying, look, it's getting a lot harder now. The, um, there, are, there are bad tenants as well in, in our suburb as well. So with all of these changes, some landlords are starting to find self-managing to be a lot more time consuming than before. Right. But a, um, a good landlord who, who might have been managing for a decade plus, who can handle all this, mm-hmm. then they're actually quite well placed and yeah, there's no reason why they shouldn't keep managing themselves if they're good and they have the confidence. But if not, then a property manager can step in and provide excellent value and time savings as well. Yeah, I guess it's, it all comes down to time, right? You have to figure out uh, whether one hour of following up with tenants and finding trades people to fix this and that is better than working on your property developments or your other business or your other work that you have. So it's, you have to decide it yourself what's more valuable. Yep. Yep. That's um, all about the individual landlord's value of time and what's best for them. All right, Jimmy, if, if I go overseas, can I manage the property myself? 
from overseas, if I live in Sydney? Uh, the Residential Tenancies Act does have a section there saying that if you're overseas for more than 21 days, you do need to appoint an agent. So this agent doesn't necessarily have to be a property manager, but the um, yeah, it could be a friend or it could be a family member. But yeah, in those cases, if they're good managers and they can help you out, that's that's great. The problem is if um, if they're not, then they can't handle rent arrears or they can't handle the maintenance side, then you're based quite far away and you've got this escalating issue and it can be quite frustrating. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had an overseas client who works with us and she was doing that until earlier this year. But what had happened was she was overseas. Her friend wasn't able to confront the tenant about their mounting rent arrears and their rent arrears ended up going over $3,000 for, for a... Um, Mind you, that's, that was actually close to eight weeks for, for the rent it was. Mm -hmm. But the moment we stepped in, the tenant ended up paying it all off over uh, six weeks. So that ended up being quite good. Right. That was through a combination of uh, WINS repayments and also us putting in the right paperwork with the consequential clauses we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So in short, you can up to 21 days, but after that, definitely go talk to a property manager or get an agent or a trusted person who you know can do the job properly. So it, it is required by law if you... Yes, that's right. right. Yep. I'll just remind the viewers that you can ask any question in the comments below on Facebook and if it's suitable and appropriate, then I'll forward it to Jimmy. I've got one more question, Jimmy, from Kostya. If I signed a term tenancy agreement, what are my options with regards to terminating it earlier? Uh, I, I assume you mean a fixed term tenancy agreement. So there's a couple of options. The first is just, well, generally you can't unless both you and the landlord agree. So the first option is to sit down with your landlord and be very cooperative with them so you can say to them, look, we're happy for you to do as many homes as many open homes as possible and find a tenant to replace us. And that's generally how most landlords operate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and most most tenants, some tenants who do come to us asking to break, that's how we work as well. We, um, yeah, we sit down, talk about open home times with them, ask the tenants to present the place tidily and we find them a replacement very quickly. So everyone's quite happy. Now, if there is actually, if the landlord is being very, very hard and refuses even to, well, if you can't get to that level, then there is the option of going to a tenancy tribunal under the hardship provisions. Mm -hmm. uh, the hardship provisions are, they, they do set quite a high bar and you would have to present your case to tribunal and basically have the adjudicator rule in your favor to break the fixed term agreement. The, the test is that the hardship that you face as a tenant must outweigh the landlord's hardship as a result of breaking this tenancy agreement. We haven't had any cases come through for that. We, as, as at Pukeko, we tend to work with the tenants rather than trying to force a situation like that. Is there any, not normally, is there any penalty if you want to exit this agreement? That's a yeah, case by case. So in the past, some landlords do put down in the fixed term agreement that there is a break fee to substitute it with a different tenant. And some adjudicators in tribunal have, have actually enforced this break fee. So yeah, usually it's a week's rent plus advertising costs. Mm -hmm. And it depends on what your landlord has in your contract. Gotcha. All right. Um, all right, so we all heard about the the new law uh, about meth tests. Mm. What's your opinion about it? Is it good, bad? I think it is actually quite good. It's the um the well laws in the tribunal. So laws, sorry, the law around meth is actually evolving quite quickly at the moment. These laws aren't being made by members of parliament, but they are being set through precedents in the um, tribunals. Mm -hmm. So a couple of months ago, there was a case in Pukekohe 
the landlord did not do a meth test and did not know that there was meth at the property. The tenants did their own meth test, found that it was a lab, and mm -hmm. went to the landlord for all for replacement of all of their furniture, all of their bedding, and and basically had to leave the property. The tribunal ruled in favour of the tenant, and the landlord had to pay sixteen thousand. Mm -hmm. So it's it's actually better to be um, to be courageous about meth and face the issue head on. Mm -hmm. Having said that. The meth cleanup costs with an honest company that does the cleaning, it's a lot, lot less than the 50,000 or 100,000 that you hear about all the time. Sometimes a, a meth cleanup can be under 1,000 or even under 500, depending on the readings. Mm -hmm. So as long as you have honest people working with you, meth, isn't a, um, meth is not the big boogeyman that it's made out to be, and it's better to confront the issue head on and provide the tenants with a safe and clean house. Mm -hmm. I see. Say um, I bought a house recently, and I didn't do a meth test as my as part of my due diligence, mm -hmm. because I was so eager, or it was an urgent deal. Anyway, now I've uh, I settled on the property, and finally I decided to do my meth test, mm. and it turned out that it does uh, appear to have. Uh, contamination. Hmm. So I'm freaking out. What should I do? Uh, the first thing to do is get what's called a. Um, so there's two types of test. One is a composite test. The uh, the tester swabs all the rooms individually, adds everything up into an average, and then tells you, yes, the property has meth, or no, it doesn't have meth. And I'm assuming that this person has fallen into the yes category. The next step is then to break up the test into different rooms. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you just then do lots of te lots more testing, or you can go back to the old test and get the test redone for each room. Mm -hmm. You might well find that it is only one or two rooms that have the problem. So first step, identify the scope of the issue. Mm -hmm. Second step is just, yeah, it's once you know the levels and the issues, we would recommend consulting with a, a professional cleaning firm and then they can tell you the best step forward. Um, for low levels of meth, it is it is a, a fairly standard cleanup. It's no worse than cleaning a house after a messy tenant, mm -hmm. but it does take a while. You have to wash the walls multiple times with certain chemicals and let it dry, then test again. What's mm -hmm. if, um, of course, I was asking about termination of his tenancy or anyone's tenancy. If mm. my tenant leaves the property and I do a meth test before I hand over the bond, mm. and I do find that there was some contamination, what mm. happened to the situation? That's a tricky one, and it depends on whether there was a clean test at the beginning, and now you've got a dirty test, oh, sorry, positive test. Yeah. So if it's clean at the beginning, of the tenancy and it's now positive, then you can reliably go after the tenants for that. If there was no clean test beforehand, then the tribunal has ruled in the past that you can't necessarily blame this tenant. Mm -hmm. It may have been the tenant beforehand, for instance. Oh. So that sets up a real can of worms. Mm -hmm. The second risk of that is then the existing tenant can then say, You've put me into a meth contaminated house. I want rent back or yeah, and it's not having a clean meth test at the beginning sets up a lot of worms later if there are issues and mm -hmm. yeah, what we've done in the past is found it was cheaper to clean up and simply move on. This was a not our tenant but someone we inherited. Mm -hmm. And coming back to this initial test, um mm. if you get a new tenant and sell your property. Mm -hmm. So you've done the test, it turned out to be positive, mm -hmm. you've done the cleanup, and it's all fine, it's negative after the cleanup. Do you mm -hmm. have to tell the tenant, the new tenant, that it was tested positively, say it's a month ago? Uh, was this before they the moved new, 
Do you know if, if there was any change, any specific requirement in the new rules that you have to disclose to a new tenant that the, after the cleanup, that, that there was a, a positive test and that you've done a cleanup of the property? That's a really hard question, and I think um, ethically you should, but then because it's negative, I think this is actually good news that you're telling them. So mm -hmm. we have run into that situation before, and we have told the te we actually went to them and said, there's a positive test in one of the rooms. We're getting it cleaned up. They'll be here on Tuesday, and then afterwards, once it's all cleaned up, we'll give you the negative test. And they mm -hmm. were actually very, very happy with it. So it can be a, a positive for the tenants. Mm -hmm. Do you tend to advertise the properties as meth free or like that you've done the test and it's clean and it's ready to be moved in for a new tenant? Is it like, do people actually ask for it? The new tenant do that? Yes. We, oh, we haven't had anyone ask at the viewings, but when we do put up, when we do the test, then we would advertise it as meth free. Mm -hmm. Um, when we do tell the new tenants that are coming in, they're often really happy to find out that it's been tested and it's come back negative. Yeah. So it, is, um, it does add a bit of value to the rental. Mm -hmm. I see. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that you, sh you think is important for landlords to know? Uh, the more recent changes. So there's... Um, so tenancy law in the last year has been moving quite rapidly more rapidly than it has for the last five years, actually. So the main changes that have happened are smoke alarms. Smoke alarms, insulation, and then there's also another set of laws that are being debated in Parliament at the moment. Yes. So smoke alarms is, um, there's now a requirement to have smoke alarms within three metres of all the bedrooms or any other sleeping areas. And these smoke alarms have to be 10-year smoke alarms. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, there's been a whole industry that sprung up offering smoke alarm audits, smoke alarm testing, and smoke alarm warrants of fitness, which in my mind is a little bit excessive. The, um, the advice that we've been given is that the MBIE does audits of smoke alarms in South Auckland, for instance, and their criteria is what the landlord has to do is to take a photo and email it to them. We personally test all of our smoke alarms as well during our inspections every three months. Yeah. And so, yeah, from legislatively, we believe that is all that's required, regular testing and also a um, photo log showing that they have been installed rather than paying an extra $150, $200 per property to get these warrant of fitnesses for smoke alarms. Mm -hmm. The second change that's come about recently, as of about one year ago now, is the insulation clauses in residential tenancy agreements. So what you can do, if you don't know as a landlord at the viewings, you can put down on your tenancy agreement that we are going to investigate this. And you have 90 days from the start of the tenancy to send in a send in a insulation assessor and get that work done for you. Mm -hmm. So in the future, all tenancy agreements must have the must discuss the levels of insulation, what type it is, what R value it is, and or what thickness it is. And that's um yeah, that's becoming commonplace, but we're still seeing a lot of tenancy agreements come over without this information yet. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, the new law changes that are being debated in Parliament. This will have a big impact on the um well, it's gonna have a big impact all over Auckland, but more so in South Auckland because what's being proposed is that a granny flat or a sleep out conversion cannot be rented out. If the tenant doesn't pay the rent and takes the landlord to tribunal and it's found out that this is a um, illegal building, then the tribunal may not order, the, well, they, they can decide not to order the tenant to pay off these rent arrears. Secondly, they can decide to order the landlord to pay back the tenant for all the rent they've paid. Wow. So we in are what uh, Jimmy, do you think it's going to happen? Is it, it only if it was built illegally? Oh, that's a, um, that would be down to each individual adjudicator and individual case. 
my gut feel is that if it was done very, very well, you might get a slap on the wrist. And this is me speculating. It's it's still being passed the law. You might get a slap on the wrist if it's a um, if if it's a technicality or if it's a you might have done all the inspections but council didn't issue the CCC or it, it's the sleep out or granny flat that has always been rented mm -hmm. out and it's done to a good standard. So yeah, the the tribunal would have to make that order, and they would make an order based on how severe their their breaches, possibly. I'm just speculating here on this. Sure. Fair enough. All right, um, it's been very interesting, Jimmy, and thanks for your uh, wise tips. And I'm gonna leave um, your details for people that want to contact you. I'm just gonna change that. You mentioned that your email. Yep. And if anyone wants to call you, then they can. I guess call your mobile. Your mobile. Okay. And, uh, yeah, we'll uh, surely we'll talk to you sometime again in the future. And thanks for your time and thanks everyone for asking questions. If you uh, want to see other interesting talks and do not miss interesting um, tips, then uh, make sure that you subscribe to this channel. And I'll see you again. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Jimmy.